All right, well, the first thing we're going to do is take a look at this uh, vocabulary list for this week, uh, the Lesson 7 vocabulary. And I just wanted to go through kind of these mnemonics, help you understand a little bit about these words, hopefully make it easier for you to memorize them. So the first word we have here is shame. It sounds just like the English word shame. Uh, it's the word for name or reputation, and just a way of connecting shame with name or reputation. First of all, it rhymes with name, and then someone might be ashamed of their reputation. So one memory aid would be the name Adolf is unpopular because of the shame of Hitler's reputation. So that's just one way to connect name and reputation with the word shame in Hebrew. Next we have the verb darash. Darash, you can tell, is a cal-perfect verb because it has the kametz patach vowel pattern here. Darash in the cal-perfect, 3ms, means he sought or he inquired. So the doctor sought or inquired as to the cause of darash on his patient's arm. So most people will associate darash with a rash of some sort and trying to figure out the source of it. So you seek the source, you inquire about the source, where did it come from? Darash is maybe even investigate or search into, something like that. Next we have zavach. Zavach is another verb, CalPerfect 3MS. We've got the kametz uh, patach pattern here. Zavach means he slaughtered or he sacrificed. And the mnemonic I have here is Zavok to the slaughter, or the walk, Zavok, you know, I guess imagine that you have a German accent. Zavok to the slaughter, or Zavok to the sacrifice, was somber. So here, the weakness of this mnemonic is that I'm treating slaughter and sacrifice here as a noun rather than a verb, but I hope that you can somehow connect this meaning of slaughter or sacrifice with zavach, because we've actually got two other words in this list that are related to this word. So um, uh, just a note on this one, the vowel pattern in this word, which is that kametz patak pattern, is what tells you that this is the verb. You do not want to uh, confuse this verbal form with the segalit noun form, zevach, which is what we have down here below. All right, so we'll get to zevach in a moment. Next, we have the verb yada. Yada, again, comets patak pattern. This is a CalPerfect 3MS. It means he knew or he cared about. So the mnemonic here, Yoda knows the ways of the Jedi. And you might even be able to connect Yoda and Jedi, if you have a similarity between the J and the Y, uh, to yada. But <clears throat> the idea here is to know. This word gets used a lot of different ways in Hebrew, but usually it's related to the idea of familiarity, something like that. All right, next we have yeshav. Yeshav, this means he sat, he dwelt, or he inhabited. Again, we've got the kametz patak vowel pattern here indicating a cal perfect 3ms. And my mnemonic here is, if squatters sit, dwell, or inhabit your house, you shove them out the door. You shove. You shove them out the door. All right. So hopefully that's helpful. Maybe not. But uh, some way to kind of connect you shove with sit, dwell, inhabit. All right. Next we have zevach. Zevach is the noun form of sacrifice. So zevach is the verbal form. Zevach is the noun form. And this is a segalit pattern. I know that we've only got one segal here rather than segal segal like Eretz or something like that. The reason why we've got a patach here is because we have the chet on the end. And these gutturals, especially chet and ayin, really prefer A-class vowels. So you will often see an A-class vowel before a chet or an ayin, where you might otherwise expect a different vowel. But this is segalit. It is two short vowels, and it's accented on the second to last syllable. That's kind of the definition of a segalit noun. So you do want to recognize that this form, with the segal patak, this is the noun form. With the, kama, with the kametz patak, this is the verb form. So keep these distinct. 
Um, if there's a, a helpful way for you to, you know, associate, it, honestly, it, it should be pretty easy because all of your verbs so far, with the exception of kaved, uh, have the kametz patach pattern, and that's what you have in zavach. So when you see zavach, you should be thinking the verb. So that when you see zevach, you can recognize, okay, this does not have the kametz in R1. And so this must be a um, noun form. All right. Make sure I don't have any other note here. All right. Next we have lev or levav. This is really the word for inner self. It often gets translated as heart. Uh, but it can also just as easily and just as frequently get translated as mind. Uh, this is a word that uh, in Hebrew, Hebrew doesn't distinguish between the emotional side, which we usually attribute to the heart, and the rational side, which we usually attribute to the mind. Hebrew doesn't um, distinguish between heart and mind in that same way that we do. And so levav, even though it's translated heart most often, it really means the inner person. So your thoughts, your feelings, all of that is encompassed by levav. And um, the mnemonic here, I don't know if you guys have ever heard this song, but Tony Bennett had a song called I Left My Heart in San Francisco. So I just finessed it into I Laved My Heart in San Francisco. All right, next we have Ms. Beach. Ms. Beach. And you can see, even in this word, we have that Zion Beit Chet root that we had up here with Zevach and with Zavach. So Zion Beit Chet, this root shows up in all three of these words. Um, what Hebrew will often do is it will take a verbal root and it will add a mem to the beginning of it. And that will sort of, the expression for it is it will nominalize the root, which means it will turn it into a noun. And so if Zavach means he slaughtered or he sacrificed, and Zevach is the sacrifice, the Mizbeach is the location of the sacrifice or the altar. All right, so um, another note here that even though Mizbeach itself looks uh, masculine singular, well, it is masculine singular, even though it's masculine singular, the plural form looks feminine. The plural form of this is Mizbachot. Now, the plural form is Mizbachot. The plural form is still masculine. It's still masculine plural. It just looks feminine, similar to Av and Avot. Avot looks feminine with that Holom Vav Tav ending. Uh, so here, Mizbeach, uh, Mizbachot looks feminine with the Holom Vav Tav ending, but it's really masculine plural. All right, next we have mishpat, mishpat. And this is also related to the root that we had earlier, shin, pe, tet, shafat, which means he judged or he decided. So what we've done, again, is we've taken the verbal root, we've added a mem to the front, and so we've nominalized this. So instead of he decided or he judged, mishpat becomes judgment or decision. All right. Um, let's see here. Next we have Om. Om is the word for people, but Om, you'll notice, is, is a singular form. This is called a collective noun or a collective singular, where the singular form re refers to a group, a single group, but that group contains plurality. So when you do see am in its plural form, which would be amim, that is then going to refer to multiple groups of people. Uh, so uh, it's often used in the context of ethnicity, so the people of uh, Aram, the people of uh, Moab, the people of Edom, those uh, locations, Om um, often gets used as an ethnic designation. But it, it really does mean group of people. And so when you see Amim, you can think of it as people groups. 
All right, so that's all the vocabulary for this week. If you have any better uh, memory aids, feel free to add them in here in the extra columns that we have. Um, anything that you come up with is probably going to be more effective for you personally, uh, but it's always interesting to see what other people come up with to kind of help you um, create something of your own. Now, Richard, I can hear your audio. Um, you may have gotten that figured out how to turn it on. Is there anything that you wanted to cover here before we continue with those exercises? Yeah, so uh, let me pull up the lesson here on the nouns and go over that. So when it comes to the masculine singular form, there isn't any sort of regular uh, dependable vowel ending in the masculine singular that you can count on. If there is no distinctive comets hey ending or hiric yod mem ending or holom vav tav ending, you can often assume that it's masculine singular. Of course, there are many exceptions to that. Eretz, for example, the word for land. Eretz does not have a comets hey, but it's still feminine. That's one of those kind of tricky ones. And at this point in the vocabulary, if you get a feminine word that doesn't have a comets hey ending, then Fatado should be telling you that that is feminine. So this is probably about 90% reliable, just looking at the ending. If there is no comets hey, hiric yod mem, or holom vav tav, then it's probably, you know, 80 to 90% of the time it's going to be masculine singular. Of course, if you see the comets hey, that is quite reliable. The comets hey very frequently indicates feminine singular. There are only a couple exceptions to that. For example, the second person pronoun ata. Uh, ata is the masculine singular form of you, whereas at is the feminine singular form. But again, those exceptions are, are much more rare for comets hey. So if you see a comets hey ending, that is going indi to indicate feminine singular most often. Hirikyod mem, almost all the time will indicate masculine plural, and holom vav tav, again, almost all the time. We saw a couple examples in our vocabulary for this week where that's not the case, but usually holom vav tav is going to indicate that that is feminine plural. So when it comes to the, the vowel in the ending, it's not so much the vowel itself as it is the ending itself. The feminine singular ending is comets hey, so you want to see that comets hey there to confirm it's feminine singular. The masculine plural ending is hiric yod mem, so you want to see all of those, the hiric, the yod, and the mem to indicate masculine plural. And then of course the feminine plural ending is holom vav tav, so when you see all of those together that will indicate feminine plural. There is no specific ending for the masculine singular, it will basically just be the bare root of the word. I shouldn't say bare root. It will have vowels, but those vowels are going to um, be, they're not going to always be consistent. There's going to be a variety of different vowel configurations that will still be masculine singular. It's just that if we don't see an explicit suffix on there, we assume that it's masculine singular. Does that make sense? Uh, did you want to clarify your question at all? Okay, perfect. All right. Well, let's uh, jump back over here to the exercises. And again, if any other question pops up, uh, feel free to jump in and stop me here. But we'll pick back up on these parsings. We're looking at lesson six, looking at the verbs, uh, particularly the Cal Perfect. Section B here, basically you are given 10 different Hebrew verbs and you're asked, you are asked to parse them. Parsing basically means you're just dividing the verb up and naming all of the different things about it. So you're going to name the pattern, which so far we've only learned the cow pattern. Other patterns that we'll learn in the future include the nifal, hifil, pl, so on. Then you're going to name the conjugation. So far the only conjugation that we've covered is the perfect conjugation. So every single one of these will start cow perfect. And then you'll give the person, first, second, or third person, the gender, masculine, feminine, or common, which means the, the same form is used regardless of whether it's masculine or feminine, and then the number, that'll be singular or plural. And then finally you'll give the root that this word is uh, built from. So number one here, shalach. This is just the basic Cal Perfect 3MS form, the lexical form. 
uh, the form that we learn in our vocabulary. You know that because it's got the comets patak vowel pattern and no suffixes. Every other form in the Cal Perfect is going to have suffixes aside from the third masculine singular. For that reason, it is sometimes referred to as the suffix conjugation. So, what you want to do is um, make sure that you distinguish between the different persons, numbers, and genders in your parsing here. But this form, without any suffix, is going to be the 3ms, and the root, of course, is shalach. All right, so we talked about shalach. Shalach without a suffix indicates that we have a third masculine singular in the Cal Perfect, and again, the root is just the shin lamed chet. Then number two, we see la kacha. La kacha. This, uh, the first thing I notice is that we have a comet's hay ending. Now, when I look at these verbs, one question that I can ask myself immediately is how many letters is a Hebrew verbal root supposed to have? And every root that we're going to learn this semester and pretty much next semester is going to have three letters. And so if I'm looking at a word that I know is a verb and I see more than three letters, I know there's something extra there and I have to figure out what letter here, for example, number two, I have four letters, which letter is extra? Which letter is not part of the root? And I can start a couple different ways. I can start from the beginning, and I can say, do we ever add lamed to the beginning of a verbal root? Well, so far we haven't learned anything like that. What about the end? Do we ever add a hey to the end of a verbal root? Well, yes, we have learned that the Cal Perfect, in the third feminine singular, we add a comet's hey. And so if you're wondering, again, we went over this a little bit last time, but you're wondering perhaps what happened to the comets patak pattern. We now have a comets and then a vocal shava. The reason why we have the vocal shava here is because when we add comets hey to the end of this word, we're adding a whole other syllable. And Hebrew doesn't want to have any more syllables in a word than it needs to. And so it's going to try to find a way to reduce some of these vowels to make more room for the extra syllable. And so because patak is a full vowel, it's not a half vowel, it's a full vowel. It is short, but it's still a full vowel. We're going to reduce that to a shava. A shava is a half vowel. It's not a full vowel. It can't stand on its own in a syllable. Uh, same for the hatef vowels, the hatef patak, hatef kametz, I'm sorry, the Hatef Patak, Hatef Segel, and yes, Hatef Kametz. Those, um, some grammars will teach that they can be their own syllable. Uh, I think it's more helpful to think of them as half vowels, and therefore they kind of piggyback on the following syllable. So what that means is, what we have here is um, La Kacha. La kacha. By shortening, I shouldn't say shortening, by reducing the patak to a shava, we've made more room, we've given ourselves more breath to use on that comet's hay ending. All right, so enough about the morphology, the changing of the spelling. The comet's hay we know indicates a third feminine singular verb in the Cal Perfect. So our pattern will be Cal, conjugation perfect, person, third, gender feminine, number singular. The root, if we take off the comets hey here, we can see that the root is lamed kof chet, lakach, which means he took or he seized. In this case, with the third feminine singular ending, it would be she took or she seized. Number three, we have halakta. Uh, halakta here. Again, how many letters is a Hebrew verbal, verbal root supposed to have? It's supposed to have three. How many do I have? I have four. All right, so if I have four letters here, which ones are the extra? Or which one is the extra? I only need three. So what has been added here? And again, in all the verbal forms that we've learned so far, the Cal Perfect verbal forms, we are adding suffixes to the word. We are adding letters to the end, not to the beginning. So most likely, if you've got more than three letters in your 
verb, most likely the letters at the end are the ones that are added. So here we can see the root is halach, which means he walked, but we've added the tav kametz suffix. Now that tav kametz comes from the pronoun ata. Ata is the second person masculine singular pronoun. It means you when you're speaking to a male, a singular male, one, one person. And so when we add that tav kametz ending to our verb, we get you walked instead of he walked. So there's going to be calperfect 2ms from the root halak, he lamed kaf. Number four, we have zachartem, zachartem. And again, how many letters is a Hebrew ver verbal root supposed to have? Three. How many do I have? I have five. So again, in the CalPerfect, we're used to adding suffixes. So if I have five letters and my extra letters are added to the end, that means these last two letters are my suffix and my first three letters here are the root. So my root is going to be zachar, which means he remembered. And then the tem suffix, this comes from the pronoun atem, or I should say atem. Atem is the pronoun you, masculine plural. And so that tells me that this is second person masculine plural. And of course, my pattern and conjugation, the only ones that we've learned so far, are the cow perfect. But zachartem would mean you all remembered, masculine. Number five, we have... Uh, shamanu, shamatnu. Here again, I have five letters. If I count the shurik here, which is a vowel letter, I have five. And so the back section of this word, the last two letters here, is most likely my suffix, and the first three are going to be my root. Shema is a word that we've learned. It means he listened or he obeyed. And then when I add the new suffix, this new ending comes from anachnu. Anachnu is the first person common plural pronoun. It means we. And so when I add nu to shema, I get shematnu, which means we listened or we obeyed or we heard. Number six, we have katavti. Katavti here again has five letters if I count the Hirik Yod, which is the Yod is a vowel letter. And so again, I'm going to take the first three letters in the Cal Perfect, and I'm going to expect that to be my root, Katav. Sure enough, Katav is a verbal root we've learned. It means he wrote. And when I add the T suffix here, this is the first common singular. So number five, new was the first common plural, Number six, katav t is the first common singular, so we would translate that as I wrote. So we've got a cal perfect, one cs from katav. Number seven, we have batak ten. Batak ten is going to be, again, the first three letters. Batak, this is a verb that we learned as he trusted. And then the ten ending comes from the pronoun Attain. Attain is again the word for you, but this is for feminine plural. So when you're speaking to a group of women, you would address them as attain, you. But when that group of women is the subject of the verb, we stick that tain on the end of the verb here in the Cal Perfect, and we get batak ten, which is you all trusted. You ladies trusted. Obviously, ladies isn't part of this verb, but that helps us to uh, explicate in English that this is ad addressed to a group of females. So we have a cal perfect, second feminine plural from batach. Number eight, we have achalu. Achalu. Now, this can be a little bit confusing here because. Um, you know, it's, it's sort of a, an unfamiliar form. We don't have our patak that we're used to seeing. Um, oftentimes when we see a shurik here, we think of the lamet. You know, the lamet is starting, uh, sort of, starting the syllable here. And so it, this can just be a little bit tricky to look at. But I'm going to help you break it down. Again, we start with the same question. 
how many letters is a Hebrew verb supposed to have? I should say a verbal root. That's three. Three letters and a verbal root. How many do I have here? Well, if I count the shurik, which is a vowel letter, as a letter, I have four. So again, I'm going to take the first three letters of my verb. That I'm going to expect to be my root. So let's check and see if that works. First three letters. Aleph, kaf, lamed, achal. Is achal a verb that I've learned so far in my vocabulary? Yes, I've learned achal means he ate. So my suffix then is the shurik. So when I see a shurik suffix, I have to remember that this is the suffix that gets added when the subject of the verb is third plural, third person plural. Whether it's third masculine plural or third feminine plural, it doesn't matter. That's why we call it third common plural, because the form is common to both masculine and feminine. But this is the third common plural form of achal. If achal means he ate, then achalu would mean they ate. Cal perfect, third person, common gender, plural in number from achal. Number nine, we have katalt. Katalt here, again, how many letters is a Hebrew verbal root supposed to have? Three. How many do I have? I have four. So what's my extra letter? Well, in the Cal perfect, the extra letter usually is on the end. So let's take off that last letter. The first three are katal. That is a verb, we, I don't think we've learned this in our vocabulary, but we've learned this as sort of our paradigm verb for the uh, different, um, different conjugations that we're going to learn. Katal means he killed. And so when I add the tav shava, it's important to notice that this is tav shava. When I add the tav shava suffix, that tav shava comes from the pronoun at. Not ata, where we would have the tav kametz, but this is from the pronoun at. And at is the feminine singular form of you. So this is going to be feminine singular, um, and it is um, second person. Second feminine singular, of course it's cal perfect. So if katal means he killed, katalt would mean you killed, speaking to a woman. Of course, the uh, root here is katal kof tet lamet. Number 10, we have katal, but this is just the lexical form. There is no suffix here. We have a kamets patak pattern. That tells us that this is the cal perfect 3ms, and the root, of course, is kof tet lamet. All right, any questions about that section B there? If not, we'll go ahead and jump into C, and again, feel free to stop me if anything comes up. Section C, we're going to try to translate these now. So, since there's no point in me really translating through here with the answers up, let me just open a Word document and use that to kind of cover up the page here. All right, so... We've got, uh, the first one here is lakach. Again, there is no suffix. It's just the kametz patak vowel pattern. That tells us we have a cal perfect 3ms form. This is the lexical form. It just means he took. Number two, we have pretty much the same thing, but we've added a shurik to the end. And in order to make room for the extra breath that we need for that shurik, we have shortened the patak. I should say we've reduced the patak to a shava. So we get la kahu, la kahu, and the shurik here is the suffix that we use for the third common plural form. So if lakach is he took, la kahu is going to be they took. Number three again we have lakach, but we've added t as our suffix, lakach t, and as I mentioned last time. When our suffix is vocalic, that means it begins with a vowel, one of the ways that we make room for the extra breath we need is we reduce what we call the theme vowel, or the second root letter vowel. But here on these consonantal suffixes, the suffixes that begin with a consonant, that doesn't allow us to reduce the patach, and so we have to do something else to compensate. 
And so what Hebrew does is it will shift the accent from the final syllable of the word back one slot. And you might think of it as it's not actually shifting at all because in the lexical form, the accent is on the kof syllable. And here it just shifts back to the kof syllable. But I think of it as shifting back because our default assumption in Hebrew is that a word is always accented on its final syllable unless there's some indication otherwise. And so here, lakachti is not accented on the final syllable, it's accented on the second to final syllable. And that's in order to make it easier to pronounce. Instead of three full syllables in a, in a row accenting the final one, instead we shift that accent back to kind of break it up. So instead of lakachti, it's lakachti. It's a little bit easier to say that way. So the T suffix here is first common, um, yeah, first common singular. So if lakach means he took, then lakachti is going to mean I took. Number four, we have lakachnu, lakachnu, and here the nu suffix comes from anachnu, that we, which means that this word now means we took. Number five, our suffix is tem, and you'll notice that something a little bit different happens here. We don't get a reduction in the patach, and because this is a consonantal suffix that's closed, it's a very, very heavy suffix, that actually pulls the accent back to the final syllable. And so the only thing that Hebrew can really do to compensate for that is it's going to reduce the first vowel instead of the patach vowel. And so here we get lachach tem, lachach tem. That tem suffix again comes from the pronoun atem. Atem means you in the masculine plural. And so number five would be translated as you all, you men, you all kill, or I'm sorry, you all took. Number six, we have the ta suffix, tav kametz. This comes from the pronoun ata, which means you masculine singular. And so here, instead of he took or you all took, this would be you singular took, you masculine singular took. Number seven, we have la kacha, la kacha. <clears throat> and again, if we look at these four letters and ask which three are part of the root and which one is extra, in the CalPerfect, the one that's extra tends to be on the end. And so Lakach is our root, Kamitz He is our suffix. That is the suffix that we find in the third feminine singular in the CalPerfect. And so we have here, she took. Number eight, we have the verb Shema. Now, we've also got an extra comets hay on the end, so that again is going to be third feminine singular. You can see again here that the patach reduces to make room for that comets hay. Shama. Shama. If shama means he listened or he heard, then shama means she listened or she heard. Number nine, we have zahra. And again, you can hopefully notice a very similar pattern between these three. They all have a, they're all different verbs, so they, de, they have a different root, but they all have kametz as the first vowel, a reduced second vowel, and then a kametz he on the end. That pattern is the pattern that we expect to see in the CalPerfect 3FS. And so even though these are different roots, the vowel patterns are the same for each one, and that indicates that it's a 3FS of the Cal Perfect. So, Zahra would be she remembered. Number 10, we have Halacht. Halacht. Here we've got the Tav Shava ending. Tav Shava comes from the pronoun At, which means you, feminine singular. And so this would be you went or you walked, feminine singular. Number 11, we have halakti, halakti. Again, that T suffix indicates first common singular. And so what we have with halakti is not he walked, but I walked. 
Number 12, we have Kavdu. Kavdu. Again, we've got four letters if we count the shurik here. In the Cal perfect, which is what we know we're working with, the extra letters tend to go on the end. And so we've got a shurik suffix. The first three letters are kaf, bait, dalit. That is the verbal root kaved, which means he was heavy or he is heavy or weighty. And so when we have the shurik suffix, it means instead of he is heavy, it means they are heavy. Number 13, we have shalacha. Again, we've got that comet's hay suffix that indicates 3fs. So this is going to be she sent. Number 14, we have sha, uh, sorry, we have shamanu. Shamanu. The nu suffix comes from anachnu, which means we. And so we have we heard, or we listened, or we obeyed. Number 15, we have achalta. Achalta. That ta suffix comes from ata, which means you, masculine singular. So the verb here is going to be you ate. Number 16, we have zachartem. Zachartem, the tem suffix, comes from atem, you, masculine plural. And so zachartem is going to be you, masculine plural, remembered. Number 17, instead of zachartem, we have zacharten. And that zacharten, the ten, comes from aten or atena, which is the feminine singular, I'm sorry, the feminine plural form of you. So this would be you, feminine plural, remembered. Number 18, zacharti. Zacharti, again, T indicates first common singular, so this would be I remembered. And then 19, natan, has no suffix at all. It's the comets patak vowel pattern. That tells us that this is a normal CalPerfect 3MS form. And so it just means he gave or he placed or he set, something like that. And then finally, number 20, we have kavadnu. Kavadnu. Now you'll notice here, first of all, it, it should jump out at you pretty quickly that our suffix is nu from anachnu, which would mean this is we, first common plural, we were heavy, or we are heavy, or we are weighty. But one thing to, to take a look at here is our lexical form is kaved with a sere in the bait syllable. But when this moves out of third person, when it goes into second person or it goes into first person, that sere is going to shift into the patak just like a normal um, non-stative CalPerfect verb would. So the only time you have to watch out for those stative vowels in the CalPerfect is in the third, actually it's only in the third masculine singular, because in the third feminine singular and in the third plural, um, the theme vowel there, that R2 vowel, will have reduced anyways. So that's section C. If there are no questions there, we'll, we'll finish up with section D here. And let's see, we're looking at translating the personal pronoun along with um, information that comes from previous lessons. So we probably have, um, I guess I don't see a definite article here, um, but we definitely have some plurals and that sort of a thing to work with. So let's work our way through here. I got rid of my Word document. Let me pull that back up. So number one is kohen ani. Kohen ani, kohen means priest or a priest, and then ani means I. So in Hebrew, this is what we call a verbless clause. In English, we don't use verbless clauses like this, so we have to supply a form of to be here to make sense of this. And in English, we put our subject or our pronoun first, and then our predicate noun we put after the verb. And so, kohen ani, we would translate as, I am a priest. We probably wouldn't say, I am priest, because in English, we don't use priest in that sort of, if the predicate nominative doesn't have a definite article, or 
if it has an indefinite article, or if it, I'm sorry, if it doesn't have a definite article or an indefinite article, then the predicate nominative tends to be qualitative. It tends to refer to a quality. So if we were to say, I am priest, in English, that almost sounds like priest is a quality that we are. And that's just not what priest means. And so that's why we would need to supply the word a priest. I am a priest in English. Number two, we have kohen who. And remember, in Hebrew, who is he and he is she. Who means he and he means she. So who here means he. He is a priest. Number three, we have kohen ata. Ata means you, so we would have you are a priest. And then number four, we have aim he. Aim he means, again, who means he, but he means she. So he here is she. She is a mother. Number five, aim at. You, feminine singular, are a mother. Number six, we have anashim haim. Anashim means men. Haim means they. So we have they are men. Number seven, we have anashim anachnu. Again, anachnu means we, so this would be we are men. Number eight, anashim atem. Atem is the masculine plural form of you. So this would be you all are men. And then number nine, nashim atem. Nashim is the feminine form of anashim. Nashim means women. And of course, atain is the feminine plural form of you. So you, feminine plural, are women. And then finally, number 10, we have nashim hena. And nashim hena, hena here is the third person feminine plural form of, uh, well, of the pronoun. And it means they, feminine plural, are women. All right, that's all the exercises for Lesson 6. Let's take a quick look here at Lesson 7 and just kind of give a little bit of an overview about how sentences work in Hebrew. I mentioned this in the announcements for this week, but Hebrew word order is a lot more flexible than English word order is. In English, we almost always begin our sentence, or at least the first part of our sentence is the subject, and then we get our main verb, which begins the predicate, and then anything else like a direct object or an indirect object or adverbs or all of that stuff, that's part of the predicate as well. But we usually go subject, then verb, then any direct or indirect objects that we may have in the sentence. Hebrew, uh, especially in historical narrative, Hebrew often begins with the verb. And then if there's an explicit subject, because remember, Hebrew a lot of the times doesn't need to name its subject the same way we do in English. That's because the subject is usually obvious from the form of the verb. And so it can sometimes be redundant to say, katal who, so that would be he killed, literally, rather than just katal, because katal, it's understood that's he, because that's the, katal is only used with the third masculine singular subject, so we don't need to throw who in there to, to mean he, we can infer that from the verbal form. So in Hebrew, the word order, because subjects are easier to identify or sometimes they're missing altogether, and because of the definite direct object marker that we have, the word order is just a lot more flexible. And so you need to be aware of that. When you come to a Hebrew sentence, don't assume that the first noun you see is the subject. Don't assume that the first word you see is the subject. Don't assume much without letting context determine what role does this word play. So if you see a subject, or if you see a noun, you need to ask, is this the subject of the verb? Is it the object of the verb? Is it the object of a preposition? What is the function of this noun in the sentence? All right, so let's take a look here at some examples. Here we have av shalach which this would be similar to English word order. You have the subject first, and then you have your verb. 
Aim shalacha. Again, subject first and then your verb. And then finally, anashim shalachu. Subject and then verb. But like I said before, in Hebrew, the verb will frequently come first. So just be ready for that. If you see a verb and then you see a noun, don't assume that the noun is the direct object, even though that will sometimes be intuitive for you because that's what we do in English. You need to specifically ask yourself, is this noun the subject of the verb or is it the object of the verb? And one easy way to tell is if the noun is the subject, it has to match in person, gender, and number what the verb is. So for example, shalahu here, this is third common plural. So the subject must be plural, and it must be third person. It can't be I or we or you. It has to be, you know, either a noun that is, you know, someone else besides the speaker or the one being spoken to. And it has to be plural. Well, anashim is plural, and so that fits in this context. But you always have to just deliberately check, is this the subject or is this a direct object? Again, if you have a direct object that is definite, you are almost always going to have this definite direct object marker right in front of that object. And there's two forms that you will see this in. It'll either be independent from the definite direct object, like here, shalach eight hasus, where it's sort of its own word, or it will be um, attached to the definite direct object with what we call a makaif. Makaif is like a Hebrew hyphen. And when that happens, because it because eight loses its accent when it attaches to the next word, uh, we shift from a sere to a segel here. All right. So those are just a couple things to keep in mind. Again, Fatato mentions that typical word order in Hebrew. This is an oversimplification. It kind of depends on what type of Hebrew you're reading, but frequently you'll see the verb first, then the subject, then the direct object. But a lot of times the verb doesn't need a separate subject noun. You can figure out the subject from the verb. So oftentimes you'll see a verb and then a noun and you have to say, is this noun after the verb my subject or my direct object? All right. Um, let me clarify something here on negative sentences. This is something that confuses some students in the exercises and I have to acknowledge that I'm not sure that the exercises explain this well for Lesson 7. But what his point is here in this section on negative sentences, all he's trying to say is the location of this negative particle in the sentence, or I should say not the location, but the word order of the sentence is going to vary depending on the intention of the speaker. Whatever the speaker is intending to emphasize negation about, that's the word that will follow this negative particle low. So let me, because this is so hard to kind of figure out just by reading it, um, let me say it for you so you can kind of hear the difference between these sentences. Um, you can ignore what's in the parentheses. The words that are in the parentheses here are not in this sentence. He's just offering this parenthetical note as an explanation for why the speaker might be emphasizing the verb send, or the noun father, or the noun horse. So here's the difference. All three of these sentences could be translated the exact same way in English. But there is a difference in emphasis between them. In Hebrew, you see that they all have the same words, but in this first one, it's lo shalach. The second one, it's lo ha'av. And the third one, it's lo et hasus. So the word order is what's different. If you can translate them the same way in English, of having these differences. So let me pronounce the differences for you. <clears throat> this first one here, even though we translate all of these as the father did not send the horse, we would say it something like, the father did not send the horse. Second one. The father did not send the horse. Third one. The father did not send the horse. So you can hear in my pronunciation there that I'm emphasizing a different element of the sentence in all three of those. The words are the same, 
but the point of emphasis is different. That's because the reason why someone might say lo shalach ha'av et hasus is not because the father did nothing with regard to a horse. It's that what the father did was not send the horse. He did do something with the horse. For example, he kept it. But again, he kept the horse is not in this sentence. This is just clarifying why you might emphasize send. The father didn't send the horse. That means he did something else with it. Or if I were to say the father did not send the horse, that doesn't mean that no one sent it. It's just emphasizing that the father was not the one who sent it. Someone else did, like for example, the mother. Or if I say the father did not send the horse, you can tell there that what I'm implying is the father did send something else. It just wasn't the horse. And so he gives the example of the father did not send the horse, he sent the garment, something like that. But again, those will be a little bit confusing in your exercises because you're not speaking your exercises, you're writing them out. And so your translation is going to be the same for all of them. You, you don't really want to include this stuff in your translation, which means you're going to get the same translation for all three of these when you do it in your exercise. So I just wanted to clarify that for you um, because that can be kind of a sticking point for students that gets a little bit confusing. Again, I covered the vocabulary at the beginning of the video uh, and do check out that memory aid spreadsheet for any mnemonics or anything like that. Make sure that you're reading the notes section of the vocabulary because it's going to clarify some things. Uh, for example, um, this is going to remind you about this patak, what we call the furtive patak. In, uh, on page 17, note 3, so go back and read that. Um, but this is one situation where you get two vowels in one syllable, but it's a special situation. And then again, here he's noting a peculiarity about the um, gender and number of Ms. Bayach. Ms. Bayach is masculine singular, but when it's in the plural, it looks feminine. This would still be masculine plural if you were to parse it. But for some strange reason, Ms. Bayak wants to take that feminine plural suffix. So it is what it is.